we get started here. Uh, so Christopher is going to be talking to us about Apache Flex. So, okay. So, welcome. Um, today I'm going to be talking about why uh, Flex is particularly good for building enterprise applications. Flex, because Flex is more than just games and ads. Usually when you talk about Flex and Flash, what most people think about is games and those flashy ads, but it's actually quite a lot more. What I'm going to be talking about today is, I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction to Flex itself, why I think it really rocks. I'll do a short introduction to the tool set and talk about the future of Flex. And then uh, at the end, we'll have a few minutes of uh, question, questions and answers. <coughs> so just a short introduction to myself. My name is Christopher Dutz. I'm a software engineer from Germany, um, mainly working in Java, Spring, Maven, Flex. In the last year, I had to do a, a lot of AGB and GWT, so I really uh, got to appreciate all the features of Flex. I'm doing web development since 2000, tried all different sorts of frameworks, got in touch with Flex in 2007, and loved it ever since. Um, recently become a PMC of the Apache Flex project, and I'm the lead developer of the Flex Mojo's Maven plugin, which I'm gonna talk a little in a few minutes. <coughs> so what is Flex? Generally, it's input. There are three types of input. There's action script, MXML, and CSS. So uh, I try to somehow uh, give you something where you can sort of uh, think in uh, terms you might be familiar with. You can think of action script being something equivalent to Java code. It's the code of the application. And you have MXML. That's an XML format. Um, you can think of that as the markup. In, in the Java world, you usually had that in form of G JSPs. And then there's CSS. That's for styling, skinning, adjusting the application. The output of a Flex application is, in general, a Flash application or an Air application, which is very, very similar. But you also are um, able to create native applications by, uh, by compiling the Flash application into a native application. There are several runtimes on which you can execute your Flex application. First of all, there's the Flash player. Everybody knows the Flash player. It usually runs in the browser and um, is mostly used for web UIs. And it has a reduced set of capabilities. Uh, so you have access to the internet, you have access to the webcam, you have access to sound hardware, graphics hardware, I.O. Uh, via um, keyboard or mouse, but you don't have access to the file system of the host uh, you're running on. And then there's the air runtime, which is mostly used for applications, not, especially not web applications. In this case, you have full access to host system resources. So you can write to the, the, to the hard disks, you can uh, open network connections, uh, you can do whatever you can do with a normal native application. And uh, above this, you have the ability to package a Flex application and the corresponding runtime to a native application. Um, if you've ever uh, used a PowerPoint, there's this ability to create an executable PowerPoint presentation. So that simply links in the PowerPoint presenter with the uh, presentation and forms a native application. You can think of that. Um, you can do that with Flex. Um, yeah. So why does Flex rock? First of all, in contrast to JavaScript, it's strongly typed. 
it's also not strongly typed. So you can sort of have the benefit of a strongly typed language, but you're not completely tied to that. You have, there are several places where, you sim where it's simply um, a lot easier to, uh, to um, be relieved of the strongly typed uh, constraints, um, but I'll talk about that in a few minutes. You can actually write your application once and run it almost everywhere. You can run it in almost every web and uh, web UI and uh, desktop uh, computer um, on Windows, Linux, Mac. You can run it on almost every tablet and mobile phone. Um, you can run it on Android, on iOS. You can even run it on Windows systems, uh, except those uh, lightweight uh, Windows 8 uh, uh, things that doesn't work on them. And you can even run it on some TV sets. What's really great is that it actually looks and works identically on every platform. Everybody who's uh, developed normal web applications using HTML and uh, JavaScript knows it's a real pain. You have to sort of test your application on every browser for every operating system because it sort of differs all the time. With Flex, you can, you're, you're sure if it runs on one, it runs on every one. And it was one of the most advanced core libraries I've come across. Um, you might think, what's this? But Adobe had really a lot of uh, experience in creating really high performance uh, UIs with Flash. And I think a lot of experience um, went into creating that Flex uh, core runtime. And uh, if you start working with Grid, for example, a lot of people think that's state of the art. But if you had uh, a chance to work with Flex, it's like going back into the Stone Ages when going to GWT. You have direct multimedia support. You have access to audio, video. You even have hardware accelerated 3D. Well, usually today, people talking about HTML5, they say, hey, whoa, we, we've got hard, we, we, have, we have OpenGL in the browser. That's awesome. So, Flex developer usually says, yeah, well, what's new about that? It has a layout engine that actually works. So everyone who has ever tried uh, creating a layout that sort of spans 100% width and 100% height on your browser, it's a real, real pain. It's the last of the virtual machine-based frameworks that's actually still alive. You all remember Silverlight. Java FX, well, Silverlight was dropped by Microsoft. Java FX died, well, several times already. So, well, sometimes I think it's sort of like a, a zombie. Never know if it's going to be good or bad. So, Flex was the best bet. Debugging. Anyone who has ever had to debug web applications in HTML and JavaScript, it's a real awful pain. Um, with, with Flex, you only have one platform to debug. Uh, you have a fantastic tool support. You have the development environments uh, from Adobe, the, the Flash Builder, or IntelliJ Ultimate. That's uh, my tool of choice, I have to admit. There are even uh, some open source, uh, Flash Develop, for example, and I, there's a quite a long list of uh, available tools, but I just took the main ones. And you directly debug inside the virtual machine, so you see what's actually happening. Not such insane debugging concepts where you sort of fake all sorts of stuff and communicate and need tons of plugins and they have to always be in sync. With Flex, everything's really easy. You can even do the profiling. Um, in Adobe's premium version of the Flash Builder, there is a built-in profiler, but Adobe even gets out, gives out one for free. So if, you're, uh, if you get one of those free Adobe Creative Cloud uh, memberships, you're able to download a tool called Adobe Scout. And with this, you can analyze your Flash application in a way I've never seen it before. You can see each frame, how long it took to render, 
uh, where the ban internet bandwidth it took, uh, where the memory went, you've got the, the, the stack trace, um, you've got everything. Skinning. That's one thing I haven't come across with any other tool. Well, they, they sometimes say, hey, we have skinning, but actually it's just changing the colors or the, the width of some borders. But to me, it's not really skinning. It's just sort of rearranging stuff slightly, formatting, making the fonts a bit bigger. Um, it was introduced with Flex 4, and it sort of consists of a skinnable component and a skin that you apply to that component. Um, the cool thing with this is you no longer have to think about what your user interface will actually look like. You can concentrate on what should this component do. So assuming you have a, a, list, com you have a list component in which you want to select elements and create new ones and edit existing ones. So what do you need? You need an, an update button, a modify button, a create button. You need the ability to select something and delete that. So just concentrate on that and, um, and just forget about how it's going to look. Um, the cool thing is you have the ability to have multiple skins for one component. So uh, depending on the platform you're running on, for example, if you want to have an application on an Android device, the controls look different than the ones on an iOS device and they look different than on a desktop. So, just forget how it's going to look. Skinning is going to take care of that. Um, and not even the components can look different. They can actually react completely different. So um, one example I like to choose for this is assuming you've got a, um, a dialogue in which you want to edit tons of properties. About Let's say you have 30 fields that you can edit. On a desktop, it's not a problem to display all of them. Um, on a mobile phone, that really sucks. You have those really small windows. And so on a mobile, it would be great if you could sort of group those elements and display them on separate tabs or have a wizard with, with which you can continue and go back. Uh, so you always have just four or five controls on one screen. I haven't come across any framework that would allow you to simply define your component, ignoring how it's going to look and work. With Flex, you can. I'll show you a pretty good example in a few minutes. Um, as I said, in Flex, you have a skinnable component, and that defines skin parts. For, for example, here we have a username field. That's of type text input. You have a, an age field. That's a numeric input. And you have two buttons. So um, additionally, it provides uh, two methods part added and part removed. So these are callbacks where Flex calls the component and says, I just added this component. So uh, if a part added is called and the button, the cancel button is passed in, you can sort of attach a click handler on that. Or if an input field is provided, you can set the default text it should, uh, should uh, display. Um, but one thing you have to keep in mind, as I said, you, the UI could be split up into several pages. So it doesn't have to be that um, initially both all of these uh, controls are available. They can come in after each other. So um, it can be that you click next and the age field is displayed. So flex calls part added provides uh, age field as, a, as an argument and you can continue to do the processing from then on. Um, the skin, it defines the visual representation and it defines the visual behavior. As I said, um, eventually a skin has no behavior at all or you have a, a tab navigation or you have a step-by-step -step wizard or something like that. For example, here's a simple text input, but you could also use a numeric spinner. If you're using um, an, an, a mobile phone, spinner doesn't really work good, so you can have a mobile spinner. So depending on what component you map in, it looks and works differently. 
Um, we're also currently working on some specialized skins, I think, uh, that are optimized for, for Android applications. So if you create an, a Flex application and use the Android skins, it looks like a native a Android application. Or you use the iOS skin and it looks like an iOS application. That's pretty important if you want to sell your application in the iTunes store, for example. Apple is pretty restrictive with that. Um, but it's not only on this micro level of uh, simple controls, it's entire composite gigantic controls. For example, uh, I'll come to the example right away. Um, there are several ways how you can actually tell the framework which skin you want to have. So you can either do that pro programmatically by setting the skin class attribute of your component and set that to some class that implements your skin. But what's a lot cooler is to do that via CSS. So in this case, you define the reset password dialog should uh, take this skin. And the cool thing is use a different CSS file and all of your components can have different vis visual components. An example for two applications I created with Flex that run on the same platform. It's identical. So this is a small, uh, it's, it was a proof of concept. It's a web page for fans of electronic music and you can sort of create dates, look for DJs and go to events and chat. But I also did a business application based on the same framework. So it's not like in the, in the web world where you usually, uh, you go on a website and see, ah, that's Confluence or ah, that's uh, whatever framework is behind it. With Flex, you're free to do whatever you want and every application can look completely different. Another cool thing is data binding. It, it automatically links um, different components with each other, mostly used for linking model and UI elements. So as soon as you change the username in your model, the UI updates automatically. You don't have to sort of go through all the controls and say, update yourself. It happens magically on its own. Um, the code for this is automatically generated by the MXML compiler. So you can think of whenever I change the property of a bindable component, it automatically fires a property changed event. And a control that displays a property automatically registers for change events. But you don't have to deal with that yourself. It's taken care of uh, by the framework. One extremely cool thing with Flex is AMF communication. AMF is a protocol uh, Adobe created uh, years ago um, and is a sort of a JSON on steroids. It's a binary communication protocol, but you're actually able to read what goes through. Um, it was introduced uh, in 2002 with Flash Player 6. It was called AMF0 and was updated in uh, 2006 uh, with AMF3. Mm, don't try looking for AMF1 or 2. They seem to have never existed. It's in, in contrast to JSON, AMF is strongly typed. So the type of an object that is serialized is transferred over the wire and you're able to use that on the other side. Um, if on the other side, you, for example, you send over a class and that doesn't exist on the other side, it automatically falls back uh, to creating generic objects that are not strongly typed, but you can access uh, all the data that was sent over. Um, what's particularly cool is it serializes types and data separately. So whenever you've worked with XML, with JSON, for every object, every property name has to be repeated over and over again. So assuming you're listing a, a list of users, 1,000 users, you have to serialize the name of each property 1,000 times. In AMF, 
it's split up. So as soon as there's a new type user, it's, it defines the type and sends that over the wire. And from then on, when serialize an, you know, an object, it simply references the type. So you can greatly reduce the amount of data sent over the wire. And it uses references when serializing the objects themselves. So um, in JSON, in XML, you're never able to transfer a cyclic object graph because the tool never knows where to stop. There is no concept of a reference in JSON or in, in, uh, in XML. Um, but in Flex, as soon as an object is serialized the second time, it simply tells uh, to use the reference uh, of the other object instead of doing it over and over again. And uh, I'd say I, I migrated an application from JSON to AMF and it reduced the size uh, to one-tenth of the original amount of data sent. And that's, that's less work to do on the server, it's less work to do on the client, it takes less memory, and it um, consumes far less bandwidth. Then in, in Flex we have so-called channel sets. So um, whenever you're creating an application, there are several ways you could communicate with the server. Um, so in channel sets, you define a set of communication variants. There are several available. For example, we have a streaming connection. You can think of that similar to the modern web socket. They didn't call it that way because well, the, the term was defined about five or six years later. There's long polling. It's sort of a simulated server push. The client opens a connection to the server and the server doesn't respond until he has something to say. Um, then we have the typical short polling in which the client polls the server, let's say, every three seconds, and normal request-response communication. Now, if you would be uh, creating an application to talk with a server and you want to implement all those four uh, communication variants, that would be a nightmare to implement. In Flex, you get it for free. So you just say, I have this set of different channels. You prioritize them. So first you try a streaming connection. For example, if you're behind a proxy, that doesn't work. So that will fail, and Flex will automatically try the next one. If that fails, it tries the next one. So you don't have to do anything. Um, but you, don't, you can't only talk to AMF servers in Flex, but you can talk to almost everything. Um, you can call JSON, you can call normal XML web services, there is even dedicated support for communicating with SOAP web services. If you want something completely different, you can implement your own protocol. And uh, I think there is a pretty uh, large set of uh, other protocols, but I didn't want to list up all of them. Those are the main ones. and. Um, I have to admit, I never needed more than that. So now we've established the connection to the server. So now's the question, how do we actually call services on the server? In Flex, we do that with remote objects. Um, assuming we've, we've got a Spring application on the server. So uh, if you're familiar with Spring, here we have a service called Artist Servers. Um, Here's the interface for that. You can see it defines a, 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 a method, list artist, that returns a list of artists. So we want to call that from our Flex client. So all we have to do is we create a new remote object that's called artist service and define, okay, whenever artist service list artist is called, register an event listener that calls a, a, a function called RO success. Um, and whenever any call to that service fails, we'll, we'll add an, a, a default uh, event listener for faults that calls RO error. Um, here you can see uh, an example where, where it's sometimes good not to be strongly typed because our uh, remote object 
doesn't have a property called list artists. But by writing exactly this, um, you can define the, the event handlers for any method you want. You, can, you could even uh, write a method that doesn't exist. It wouldn't produce an error first when you call it. It would say, hey, I don't know that method. Um, but it makes um, communicating with the server really, really easy. Because all you have to do, artist service list artists, and that automatically calls this function. As soon as the server processed that request and serialized this list of artists, this method is called in the client, and you get uh, the, uh, the result out of the result event. All you have to do is uh, save it in a variable called data provider, for example, and that's all you have to do. Because um, if you defined data provider as a, a bindable property, um, this will automatically, your, your UI list will automatically update itself. You don't have to call list update now. All you have to do, you change the data provider, the data binding takes care of the updating, no more co code needed. When it comes to front end testing an application, I remember that being a total nightmare with normal HTML based applications. So you have this gigantic DOM in which you sort of have to describe what you're actually looking for. If you, if you write that, that HTML code yourself, it's okay, but whenever you've looked at uh, the, the output of a GUID application, that's a real pain to automate. In Flex, they were very, very in, uh, innovative. Uh, they provided a set of controls for every control in the framework with which you can um, remote control that component. Um, these remote controls, they are not part of the application that you ship, but you can link it in. Uh, so so if, you've got, you, if you're building your application in your CI server, you can sort of just link in the automation controls and you get an application that's a little bigger, but you can automate it uh, from automation tools. Um, these remote controls provide a standardized um, application interface with which a, a, a really wide variety of tools can access them. So, so it, you don't have, you, you're not fixed to one particular solution. There are about, I, I, I once did an evaluation, I think there were 10 or 20 different frameworks you could use to automate your Flex application. And sometimes you start creating your own application. So assuming you have a list and you've, you added a, a filtered list that you can type in a filter at the top and you have a refresh button and whatever. Now you're able to create your own automation controls that you, you give assistance to the guys writing the tests how to automate that custom component it makes testing a lot easier. You, you really start scripting down what you actually want to do and you completely forget about all this nightmarish XPath uh, expressions you have to enter to, to automate a normal web application. So, that was the introduction to Flex. <laughs> um, now, what, what tool set does do you need when developing a Flex enterprise application? So first of all, there's the Flex SDK. You need some build tools. Um, if, you, if you like AND, that's already part of the, um, of the FDK. Um, if you want to use Maven, you can use uh, Flex Mojos. It's, a, it's a, a, a Maven plugin that enables you to build Flex applications. Um, if you want to talk to, the, to a server using AMF, you need a, a server-side AMF adapter. For example, Blaze DS, that's the Apache. Uh, hopefully soon, the Apache one, it's currently being donated. Unit testing, it's, for example, FlexUnit. That's also currently being donated to Apache. There's a really, really big zoo of frameworks available 
for Flex that deal with all sorts of stuff. I'll, I've got a list in a few minutes. There's an even bigger amount of custom controls that you can simply link in, or some are open source, some are, not, uh, are commercial, but it's a really, really big uh, amount of controls that you can simply use. The Flex SDK, it mainly consists of the compiler that does the action script MXML to Flash compilation. It comes with uh, some run times that you can uh, run in a flash player or in, in the air uh, runtime. Um, it comes with a core library that provides all the core functionality of the Flex framework. And it comes with a, a, a wide variety of tools. Um, as I mentioned, the ant targets to build your application with ant. It has a tool called ASDoc to automatically generate your uh, API documentation. Um, it has a captive runtime linker. That's what I mentioned, that you sort of link the runtime with the Flash application to a native application. And you have an iOS cross-compiler with that, which you can create a native uh, Objective-C application that you're actually allowed to sell in the iTunes store. So in general, you can think of that similar to the Java SDK. So you, you also, ha in, in Java, you have a compiler and the runtimes mainly implemented in C or something uh, not Java, and you have the core libraries all in form of jar files. Flexmojos is uh, the project I'm uh, mainly working on, and this is the tool with which you can integrate a Flex build in your Maven build. It's a Maven plugin, and it defines in which phases of the Maven build what tools are executed and provides the wrappers to execute them. Uh, for example, it, has, uh, it provides all you need for automatic code generation. So if you've got a, a highly advanced model on your Java side, you don't want to re-implement those types on the Flex side. So the way you do it is you simply write your Java classes and have the code generator generate the action script counterpart to that. Um, it automates controlling the, the Flex compiler. It takes care of running the unit tests and uh, makes sure the output of the unit tests uh, come into the Surefire reports of Maven. It, if you want, you can have the AS doc tool automatically generate the API documentation and it perfectly integrates itself into a normal Maven build. The server-side AMF adapters, as I said, uh, provide all the logic you need to uh, communicate with the clients. But these clients don't only have to be fl Flash clients. You can also talk to other AMF clients. You can talk to other Java virtual machines that also run um, an, an AMF adapter. You can talk to Android devices. Uh, wherever you just use the AMF protocol, you can use these server-side AMF adapters. For example, I, I implemented a, a BERT reporting driver that accesses a server using AMF. Works really nicely. BlazeDS is the, it was initially Adobe's free version of their lifecycle uh, services. Um, and is currently being donated to the Apache Flex project. I think it's pretty, uh, come pretty far, but there still need to be some legal things signed, but it's gonna happen soon. But there is a really big variety of other implementations. For example, Granite DS, that's a pretty advanced uh, implementation, but that's not inside of the Apache Foundation. Um, but there are also adapters for PHP, for .NET, whatever you like. With Unix testing tools, they provide everything you need to create unit tests for your application. So you've all created unit tests, hopefully, for your Java code. With FlexUnit or any other unit test tool for Flex, you can create those unit tests for Flex too. For example, FlexUnit, which is soon going to be part of Apache. There's also ASUnit, FLuint, uh, FUnit, 
uh, they all have differences. Yeah? I have to admit, I like FlexUnit by far the most. Um, what, but what really differentiates them from normal Java unit test tools is that they need to be able to test asynchronous applications. So uh, in Flex, everything is asynchronous. So if you call the list artists service, it directly returns. You can't assert anything there. You have to wait till that response comes back, and there you can do uh, any assertions on the results. So just be aware that uh, writing unit tests for asynchronous applications is a little bit tricky, but FlexUnit helps you quite a lot. There is, as I mentioned, a really big farm of different frameworks available. There are inversion of control frameworks. There are model view controller frameworks. There are message bus frameworks uh, for that, that deal with event handling. There are all sorts of combinations of the above uh, frameworks. There are 3D rendering engines, client-side PDF generations. Well, those are the ones that I use most, but there are far more uh, frameworks for all different sorts. I think they are, I've seen all sorts of stuff, uh, web chats, uh, with that, that use the, the webcam and really, really a lot of stuff. I, I did a, I did a, sh a little table of uh, the, the main players in the, let's say, inversion of control, model view controller, event handling things. Um, there are a lot of projects. Each have different features, as you can see, uh, and they have a, a, a wide variety of, uh, let's say, activity. There are frameworks they. They had uh, the last update two or three years ago, but there are also very active projects. So it's up to you to decide what you actually need. Um, when, com when it comes to components, there is a really, really big variety of open source ones, but an even bigger one of commercial components. Um, controls can be simple types of input fields. So You've got a really nice date selector or a, a mobile spinner or a text input field that has automatic uh, credit card validation or whatever you like. There are custom layout components that do some really neat layouting stuff, especially in the mobile uh, business there. There is quite a lot of stuff. There are really big components such as calendars, so you can really have sort of like uh, an Outlook calendar-like component in your application. There are a lot of mapping stuff, so you, you, have, uh, you can embed Google Maps into your Flash application. Uh, a lot of charting stuff. Uh, that was one of the, the things where uh, I think SAP, for a long time, they had a lot of controls that were actually implemented in Flash because they didn't have any other way to implement something similarly. Um, if you want to have an overview of what's possible, and um, there's a pretty good uh, uh, thing called Tour de Flex. That has also been currently donated to Apache, but is, hasn't uh, arrived yet. So if you have a look at that, um, it's a, a pretty a large set. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in Flex we have hardware 3D support. Um, Flex itself already has, uh, the, uh, every component in Flex has an X, Y, and Z coordinate. And you're able to flip anything around any axis you think of. Usually you don't use it, but it's always there. Uh, but sometimes you want to have a real 3D rendering engine, uh, especially if you're running games, probably. I, I can't imagine a, a, a business application in which you really have to have some a real uh, 3D rendering engine. Um, for example, I wanted to show you what's possible. I hope you guys are not draining the internet like the guys back there. Yeah, I was looking for something that, uh, oh. So that's a little uh, application Red Bull created in Flex. I think we'll just Skip the intro. Yeah, 
I have that scene come up sh faster, but. <laughs> Well, maybe we'll just let that load and come right back to that. Ah, mm. yeah, I think it's still it's gonna take a few seconds, but I think he'll get. Uh, so, I, I think you get a pretty good impression that it's actually not that bad. I have seen better uh, implementations, but this one is actually fun. <laughs> yeah, so I guess that's why uh, a lot of game developers really like Flex. So just shut that down. Um, yeah, I, I wrote that down. Um, if, if any one of you uh, got the slides uh, prior to this talk, uh, please uh, get them again uh, in a few hours because uh, I updated them uh, quite a lot since submitting them. Um, so a lot of when, when Adobe sort of gave up on Flex, a lot of people said, ah, Flex is going to die. But um, a lot of people thought that's a really good chance to start creating something great. And um, even if critics said it's dead, it's very much alive. We have more than a million page views uh, on, the, on the Flex website. We have more than 30,000 installs since we started tracking. Um, but that, that will be a, a lot more because, uh, especially if you're, you're using Maven, for example, if you've got a company with 200 developers, you only need to download it once, deploy it to your Maven repository, and you never have to download it again. So I think this number is quite a lot higher. Um, with, with every new Flex version we, uh, we give out, the, n amount of in, uh, the number of installs grows. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that less and less people install, it's more and more do it. Uh, and there are some really, really cool things in the pipeline. Um, Alex here is uh, working hard on uh, finishing the Falcon compiler. That's a completely new implementation of the Flex compiler. And uh, it will allow us, for example, to create Flex.js applications. So that will be something really, really awesome because we'll be able to create applications in Flex and debug them and profile them and fix them. And as soon as we're finished, we flip the switch and out comes an HTML5 and JavaScript application. So that should uh, sort of uh, prevent critics from uh, ripping it apart. Um, yeah, for all of you who, who want to see that Flix is uh, not dead, please visit that page and have a good laugh. Um, I uh, had a look in the internet for some statistics that were somewhat uh, new. For example, here, use it usage distribution amongst uh, cross-platform tool developers, actually people using it. So you can see uh, the phone gap here, jQuery mobile, but Air is on third place, so it's not that uh, nobody uses this. Um, it's the most well-known tool. Well, I don't know if you, but yeah. I found that, I found it quite interesting, but just because somebody knows it doesn't mean he uses it. Um, there are some other Flex events here that I'd like to uh, promote here a little. Um, Alex is going to have two talks on um, what's currently happening in the Apache Flex project and uh, is going to have a, a talk on this uh, Flex.js that I just talked about. So we also, well, had two hackathons already. Yesterday we were working on uh, how we can change things that we'll be able to publish uh, Flex in Maven Central. Currently, you have to download the Flex SDK, convert it into a Mavenized form, and then you can use it. But what we want to achieve is that in the near future, you'll just be able to update the version in your Maven uh, POM, and it'll fetch Flex completely, completely automatically. Uh, yeah, a few hours ago we started uh, adding support 
to the new Falcon compiler to flex mojos. Well, we were sort of uh, stuck because uh, uh, somebody started uh, draining the internet and we, <laughs> we weren't able to download anything. But that's going to happen in the, in the next few days, I think. And uh, really looking forward to experimenting with Falcon and FlexJS and in Flex Mojos. Well, thanks for listening. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. 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 Currently, I have to say, when it comes uh, to convincing a customer to create a flex application, I think that's usually I, I get to convince them still to try it. But it's I think that's the thing flex developers hear most. Oh, Flash is dead. Yeah, it, it isn't dead. It's just some papers wrote that it's dead, but um, it isn't. But I think this will definitely make life easier for uh, developers in. Uh, convincing uh, product owners to uh, take the flex side. No. <laughs> that's, that's one thing. Um, but I have to say, as soon as it's going to be uh, flex.js, but I don't know, Alex, it's a, uh, as soon as it's uh, FlexJS, I think Google should uh, actually be able to do something with it. Uh, if uh, Flex is Google friendly. So I thought that if you've got a good application, that Google will be able to do anything with that, and it comes from the same house. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it depends on what you call traditional. So, for example, if you uh, quick test professional or QTP, uh, that's actually the the first tool that supported Flex. Uh, so, a lot of those uh, commercial testing tools support Flex. Uh, even even uh, Selenium WebDriver, uh, it has support for Flex. So, uh, yeah. A few years ago, you couldn't use Selenium. You, you, there was this uh, Flex Monkey thing you had to use, but that never really worked very well. But in the meanwhile, um, uh, Selenium, uh, the Selenium web driver it works really good. And, and one thing that I might note is that um, 
one week ago, there was a, if, if any one of you knows Sonar Cube, it's, it's a tool for automatically um, evaluating source code and uh, applying metrics to that. Uh, the, huh? Uh, what? No, they don't have a new Flex plugin. That, that, they, they had that for quite some time. But what's really awesome is that starting with version 4.2, you're actually able to evaluate multi-language projects. Currently, uh, till uh, 4.2, you had to uh, have separate builds. You had to build it once and evaluate your Java side and build it a second time and evaluate your Flex side. Starting with 4.2, you're actually able to do it in one run. And that's, that really rocks. Sonar Cube. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have any other questions. Okay, well then thank you. <laughs>